Welcome to Real Estate Investing Abundance, the show for busy, fulfilled professionals like you to learn how to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alan Lomax. Hello, enlightened investors. Welcome, and I'm delighted that you are joining us for the launch of our new podcast, Real Estate Investing Abundance. Three times each week, we will bring value bombs of investment wisdom from the most successful and renowned experts in the industry. The focus is on passive investment in real estate to help you as our listeners develop financial independence to live life abundantly. If you enjoy the show, please take a moment, find us on Apple Podcasts, and leave us a review. Reviews are vital to growing our audience so we can help more people find their avenue to financial freedom. Each week for the first four weeks, we will do a drawing of all those who submit reviews. The winner of the drawing will receive a $25 Barnes & Noble gift certificate. So please go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Hello, enlightened investors. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Dr. Allen. Today, we take an inside look at what it is to be a general partner in a real estate syndication. Our guest started with nothing, and after putting his system in place and following it diligently for 18 months, he acquired his first apartment complex of 218 units. As a busy professional passionate about the work of your calling, you may have come to the realization that the hope of developing financial independence has taken a backseat to the priorities of following your passion. If you can identify with this, as I certainly can, I have great news. Steed Talker Capital is an investment company designed for passionate, fulfilled professionals like you and me to help us develop passive streams of income built on solid real estate investments. Go to our website steedtalker.com and get your free copy of 10 Easy Steps to Passive Real Estate Investing, a one-pager guide that demystifies the process of passive real estate investing. Today's guest, Anthony Metzger, trained as a winemaker, and he spent his 20s following the grape harvest around the world making wine and documenting the winemaking process. In his late 20s, He took the dive into real estate syndication, and he is here with us today to share the story of how that all began. But Anthony, before we go into real estate syndication, share a memorable experience from your formative years that helped you to be the person you are today. Dr. Allen, I appreciate you having me on your podcast today. It's an honor, and I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. And to get right into your first question, like you mentioned in the intro there, I did get started into syndication and real estate in my late 20s. It wasn't something I was interested in right out of college. So what I was interested was traveling and actually the wine industry. So I worked in the wine industry for quite a while throughout my 20s. I'm traveling the world, making wine, getting my certification as a sommelier, going to Napa Valley College, studying wine marketing. So Love my 20s, love the wine industry. I think when you're traveling the world in, in your early 20s, you develop a certain type of character compared to if you go right to a college and then maybe getting a cubicle type job. So I've always had that free spirit that can't be bottled up really. And I think that goes really well with being an entrepreneur. I see entrepreneurs that are very conservative and, and they do very well, but like I'm much a little more loud and, and just can't be bottled up. So I think I think my travels, meeting new people, speaking different languages, being thrown into situations that were completely foreign to me. I think that's really helped develop my character and helped me out as uh, becoming and getting into entrepreneurship. Sounds like a really wonderful way to spend your 20s. Lots of new adventures and a lot of new opportunities and meeting all kinds of different people. What a way to spend your 20s. More people uh, should actually do that. Not only were you making wine, but you actually were doing documentaries and you did make a documentary about uh, the winemaking process in South Africa. Most people don't even think of South Africa as a wine producing country, but there you were in South Africa and making wine and making a documentary. Tell us about the documentary. Sure. Yeah. I spent five, I went down to South Africa by myself. I spent five weeks there and to get to see where I started here is what I wanted to do was create a documentary about wines and particularly wines of the world. And that's what it was called in the beginning. But, and I I just decided, I think I picked up a wine magazine and there was this cool story about South African wine. I go, I'm going to go to South Africa and make my documentary. 
because I knew I could go one place. And so I just decided I picked South Africa. I planned the trip there, spent five weeks there and filmed a documentary about wine, about the people, about the culture. And like I said, I went by myself. This was definitely like a backpackers documentary. Then I brought, after filming it, I brought it back here to the U.S. and, and we edited it. I actually hired a professional editing company. So that, that was, that's why it looks so nice. But if you go to YouTube, you can check out the documentary. I think you type in the pink grape South Africa wine documentary and it'll pop up. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. And the goal there was really to expose South Africa as a wine producing country, bring it to light. And, and, and the thing with me is I love stories. Stories are entertaining. Stories are a great way to learn. So I felt like this would be the best way to teach somebody that's, I've been to wine school and it can get boring when you talk about the, t the technicals all the time. But if you're out there, like, like in, in South Africa, one of the stories I, I captured was this guy, a winemaker, took a barrel of wine from his cellar where you typically age your barrel, your barrels of wine. And he, he actually put it in his truck and drove it down to the ocean and sunk it two kilometers off of the southernmost tip of the continent of Africa into the ocean, two, two kilometers out there and let it age out there for 18 months. And so I went to his winery. We, we did a tasting of that wine. He only ever did one barrel. We did the tasting on the barrel. We talked to him about the story of it. We got original footage of the dive and everything and the great white shark. So really cool story. It's all about storytelling. And um, that's really what the purpose of it was. And I do plan on getting back into it in the near future here, actually. What did the wine taste like? It was interesting, actually, because we did a side by side of the wine that was aged in the cellar. And uh, the cellar definitely had more of the oak influence. And the, the wine that was aged in the ocean, because there was less oxygen touching it, it almost froze the wine in time. And so it was a lot more fruity. However, there was, and I'm not quite sure how to explain it, but there was a, like a licorice taste. And obviously you think it's salty, if you will. And obviously you think, well, it's in the ocean, it's going to be salty, but really the water didn't penetrate the barrel, but it did have a unique kind of licorice aftertaste, which is, which was really fun, and really tasty, really when you're sitting there at drinking it, it's all about uh, the story. And for me, that's really what made it taste really good. So neat. I'm sure you have a much more refined wine taste than I. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. As an industry-leading, relationship-focused, design-build construction firm, Mosaic Construction has worked in many different asset classes from multifamily to retail, medical, industrial, and commercial. Mosaic Construction works to execute interior and exterior renovations with their team of trades and project managers. Their experience with value-add improvements has resulted in increased ROI and long-term value of the assets. They work nationally in partnership with local trades to deliver thoughtful, problem-solving construction management solutions to all their clients. For a personal no-obligation consultation, call Ira Singer, 773-491-3145, or email Ira at mosaicconstruction.net. You can also find Ira on LinkedIn. Right, let's get into real estate and take us down the road from where you got started and what you went through to get into that first 218 unit uh, complex. Sure. Yeah. So after my wine adventures, I, I came home back here to Minnesota and looked at all my options. I realized well, traveling the world, making wine, it's good in your twenties. It's not going to, not forever. But so I had to start thinking, okay, what am I going to do? I could move to California, work in a winery. I could go get a job, you know, as a distributor. I could do a lot of things in the wine industry. I could go live abroad at full time. But for me going back, I really am. I really do have that entrepreneurial spirit. So I decided that I want to do something more in business and something on my own terms that I can chase on my own. Like your podcast, one day I, I, I got introduced to a real estate podcast and found out about passive investing and found out about buying apartment buildings or and passive income and all the benefits of investing in real estate. And I go, God, that's what I want to pursue. That's what I decided. I'm just going to chase that and see how that goes. Listen to that podcast. Then I started getting educated. I bought a program for a thousand bucks that educates you on how to underwrite and analyze deals. Then I found out about syndications because I didn't have any money. So I, I didn't have money to go buy the, a building. So I found out about syndications where you can partner with people, raise money from passive investors to buy the buy building. And, and so I found a group that was syndicating deals, private equity group. And I reached out to them and I said, well, how can I add value to you guys? And they go, well, right now it's really difficult to find a, a great deal great apartment deal. And so I said, and they said, if you can find us one, bring it to us and we'll partner with you on it. And so I learned, I figured out what their investing criteria was. And every day after work, just about, I'd go home to my home office and analyze deals, reach out to brokers, 
just keep analyzing deals until I found, and a year and a half later, I ended up finding one that came across my inbox. I analyzed it, worked out, and I brought it to this group. They liked it. And sure enough, we ended up closing on it together. And that happened to be 218 units. And that was my very first deal. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, uh, pretty cool deal. You got into your first deal. How many did you even count? How many offers? How many underwriting processes did you go through? before you got to this one deal? Sure. I didn't keep exact count, but it must have been in the couple hundred, I would say, deals that I looked at. And, and mind you, in the very beginning, when I'm just getting started, just starting to learn, I would analyze just about anything. Things that nowadays I could look at a picture of and realize, and just know off the top of my head, that's not going to work for us. But it's great to analyze stuff if you're trying to learn. I had this big calculator that was like 10 tabs long and all this stuff. So I was just like practicing and, and running deals through it so I could sharpen my pencil and, and get a better understanding of how it works. So I did analyze a lot of garbage that I wouldn't analyze today, but um, no, a couple hundred. And this one, actually, this deal was part of a portfolio that was being sold. And so mm. what I did is I analyzed, I broke the portfolio up and analyzed each deal separately and realized that one deal in the portfolio didn't work, but this one did work. At least we were closer to the asking price on it. Mm. And then I reached out to the broker and said, hey, are you guys interested in just selling, selling these properties separately? And, and sure enough, they were. So that's how I ended up finding that little gem hidden in a portfolio there. But yeah, a couple hundred, I would say at least 18 months. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that's not unusual these days. Almost everybody I talk to is putting in close to that many offers before they get one deal on the table, and that's experienced operators. We were talking before we started, it truly is a seller's market uh, these days, so it's really difficult to find properties that are going to be value-add and cash flow, and that's what's important to us small operators, and the reason it's so competitive these days is because institutional buyers, they'll take a much smaller cash flow and they're not even necessarily interested in value-add properties. And it's difficult to compete in that uh, kind of market. What is your advice for someone just starting out in the active side of the business like you're doing? What's your advice for them? Yeah, I look back at, and I look at what worked, what, I, what, like what ended up, what did I do that ended up making this come to fruition? And I, I think of a few things. There was one, it was the getting educated, learning the language of real estate investing, listening to podcasts like yours. That's, that's really how I started off organic like that. Then I got into the audio books. Then I found a group that I liked that was syndicating, started uh, keeping a close eye on them, reaching out to them, attending their live events. That's definitely a big one. Networking is, is this industry, this business syndications, it's a, it's a team sport. So rarely are you going to go out there and find that one guy who's doing it, syndicating everything by himself. It's just, I, I wouldn't even want to do that. This is a team sport. The more people you get involved, the better deals you're going to find, the better due diligence, the less mistakes you're going to, you're going to make along the way. T being a team sport, I would say networking is very powerful. Go to the live events. If you can't travel and do the big live events, go to local meetups, find guys in your market that are doing deals and just reach out to them and see how can you add value? What are you guys doing? How does that work? Obviously hiring a coach is a massive investment, like a good investment and definitely lead to doing deals. So that's really the road that I, and then obviously the big one, not giving up because there was 18 months to go home after work and, and work for no money and, and just doing all of this on your own dime, on your own dime. It would have been easy to quit. And I'm sure a lot of people do. I looked at my situation. I was just like, if I quit, I, what else am I going to do? So that's why I didn't really quit. If there was something else, I may have been tempted, but I just, I was convinced. I go, if I find the right deal, these guys will partner with me. So all I got to do is find it. And then, then everything will get easier. But so yeah, not giving up, getting educated, finding a team, networking, getting a coach, continuing ad. I still buy programs, real estate programs online and say, Hey, how's this group doing things? 500 bucks. Okay. It's worth the investment and you're investing in yourself. You can put 500 bucks into a educational program that teaches you a different technique on how this group's doing deals. And it may help you find, be more competitive in finding deals. That's a great investment. So those are the key takeaways uh, looking back that worked for me and that I'm continuing to do today. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Would you ever invest all your money in a single stock? Very unlikely. Yet investors are willing to risk $50,000 to $100,000 in a single property in real estate all the time. Avestor is the world's first customizable real estate investment platform. 
Investors can build their own custom portfolio selecting investments across multiple asset classes such as single-family homes, multifamily, student housing, self-storage, and shopping centers. You can also invest across multiple markets and different time frames. Avestra also enables other real estate entrepreneurs and syndicators to build and use Avestra's infrastructure and cloud platform to create their own customizable real estate funds. To learn more, visit us at avestorinc.com. Avestor, real estate investing made simple. Break this down just a little bit more for us. You talked about the underwriting process and you did that diligently and you underwrote uh, some 200 properties, but there's more to it than just underwriting. So you find this property. What is the next step once you find a property that you have underwritten? It works, the numbers work, and uh, you want to get it an LOI on that. How do you do that? Where do you go? How do you go about that? So if I get a deal sent to me, I, I plug in all the numbers, trailing 12, and, and I start doing some rent analysis to see what the pro forma could be. Once I have all those numbers entered in and it looks like we're lining up and, and what I'm predicting we can do and everything, it looks like this deal may work. The next step I do then actually before anything is I eight talk to my partners, see if there's some interest, talk to my investors very lightly, just run it by them. Then, but the big thing is talking to a property management company. That's the next step to confirm all of the numbers and maybe get them to give us a pro forma. Once everything's confirmed and we're confident in the numbers, then then uh, we go ahead and we'll submit an LOI. So like like I like I mentioned actually before we went live here, I got an offer out there on a deal. It's a full asking offer actually, direct to seller on a 200 unit complex five miles west of our property in Little Rock right now. And and we'll just use that as a perfect example because it's real. We reached out to the we we were in contact with the owner. He provided us the, the financials. We plugged it into our model. Then we looked at the pro forma. We looked at comparable sale properties that were for sale recently and breaking down, the, just analyzing it, doing a deep analysis on it. Then we reached out to our property manager. They gave us a pro forma. It lined up. Now, and then from that point, we were comfortable in submitting an LOI. And that's what we did. And now the LOI is sitting on the seller's desk and they're looking for a 1031 exchange option. If they can't find one, they may not actually sell it. But anyway, so that's really what it, it comes down to, to get that LOI over there is, is doing our own analysis, talking with my partners, and then talking to the property management company. And that leads to an LOI. So not just any property management company, but a property management company familiar with that particular area. But you do your complete analysis of that. You do your rent comparables and uh, your market comparables even before you get in touch with the the property management company. And so you're working directly with the uh, seller on this. Is there a broker involved in this or you just went, you went directly to the seller and there's no broker involved? Right. This one, there's no broker involved. And um, going back to the property management you're, you're right. So I'll do my own analysis before even reaching out to the property manager, because one thing in this business too, is you really don't want to waste anyone's time, including your property manager's time and your partner's time and your investor's time. So you want to take on, you want to, I, it's, I do the anal, analyze the numbers first. And if I feel like we're in the ballpark, then I take the next step forward. But I wouldn't just reach out to a property management company without first doing my own analysis, because if they come back with numbers and we're just completely off, I just wasted their time on something that I could have done. Now, obviously, if I had 3,000 units with a property management company and, and then maybe if they had some analysts that could just do things for me all the time. Once you get to different levels, you get different relationships and stuff. But where I'm at right now, I'm just doing that one deal, being with partners. We got a few deals. Yeah, I do. I don't want to waste anyone's time. So I do my own analysis first. How is this 218 unit uh, deal going? Let's say you've been in it a little over a year. Is that correct? So how is it uh, going in terms of the projections? And is it on course? I'm sure it hasn't been just totally and completely smooth sailing. It never is. Is. So what are some of the stumbling blocks that could have popped up? Yeah, no. The, so this deal actually not. So actually, yeah, when the pandemic hit was probably the biggest road bump we've had so far with this one. So I did hear, I, we do talk to other property owners. Some of the properties that my partners own weren't really affected by the pandemic in certain markets, but for some reason, Little Rock and this property, we did get hit with it. So what we did actually is we we stopped making distri cash flow distributions that we promised. The reason we decided to do that as operators is because we wanted to make sure we had enough cash reserves with such an uncertain future ahead of us. And so therefore it did throw off what we pitched to our investors, if you will. But 
when you ask our investors, they do respect our decision making there because they understand where that pandemic, especially in the beginning, was very frightening and very there was so much uncertainty. And so they were our investors were they understood that hey, look, keep the cash in the account in case anything you know, all of a sudden vacancy dips or this thing goes on for years and whatever. So that's one of the one of the humps that we had to get over. But um, now that we're coming out of this thing, we're, we do plan on getting back on, on track with the distributions. As far as projections, actually, when we underwrote it, we underwrote an exit cap, I believe, of 7%. And things right now are trading around 6%. So we actually plan. See, that was the beautiful thing, too, with experienced operators like us, is that we our underwriting is conservative. So we underwrote an exit cap at 7 Things are trading around a 6 So where our exit strategies is looking better and better right now, especially like you said, as the market's so hot, but we do have a few more years on this one. We're holding it. We do plan on holding it for a few more years. So cap rates have gone down. That means purchase prices have gone up. Sounds like it could be a good exit. Even at this point in time, capital preservation is always the the number one priority. And of course, that's why you withheld the distributions. Were those preferred distributions? No, they weren't. Okay. So they don't necessarily have to be made up, but hopefully you'll make those up at the time you refinance or sell the property. Enlightened investors will be right back after this important message. I hope you're finding today's show informative and enlightening and that you will please take a moment to find us on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Each week for the first four weeks of the launch, we will hold a drawing of all those who submit reviews. The winner of the drawing will receive a $25 Barnes & Noble gift certificate. Reviews are very important for growing our audience. Your review will be immensely appreciated and will help others find their avenue to financial freedom. Outside of the pandemic, how is everything going with the with the property? Yeah, so far everything other than that is uh, is going well. Yeah, occupancy is going up really well. Management's doing great. That's again going back to the team. That's where that's why this is such an attractive asset. It's we'll take this deal for example. Like my we're a team of guys, the general partners. So really, we have an asset manager who just takes care. They come in after we do the acquisition and they just manage the asset. And then as one of the team members, we're here, we're there to support the asset manager. But once you get things up and running and they're going smooth, these deals don't take much of your time. Once a week phone call with your property management company, a lot of times will do it. Even uh, once you get um, stabilized once a month can get it done. So no, these things, this it's go, it goes smooth. It's, it's going smooth. And once, once we get this, now that we got this one on track and it's running, we're on to the next, we're looking for the next deal to to buy. So it's it's going good. What class of property was this? This one was actually, we call it, the property was about a C plus, but the location was an A plus. So that was really, that really was nice for us. There was a ton of opportunity to go in there and fix the place up, but across the street, you got houses selling for one, $2 million. And um, it's in the hot neighborhood with a lot of walking and biking paths, all the little shops and and the restaurants, very desirable location, which is really great To, to syndicate a deal and get something in an A location is pretty rare. So we're very fortunate with that, but the property was a C plus. And now, now that we've done some renovations to it, we're, we're, it's now a B property. Mm. So 1970s construction. Yeah. Yeah. What has been your per unit cost on the renovation? I think on average, it's about, we're about 6,500 on average across uh, ones, twos, and threes. Like Obviously the ones are a little yeah. less. So yeah, that's just an average mm-hmm. number. Yeah. About 65, seven. And, and I actually, that's for like interior. So interior. And then obviously we do some exterior stuff with the parking lots and then deferred maintenance, little things like that. Landscaping, make the place look uh, more appealing, signage, redoing the uh, leasing office, stuff like that. We actually found a leaking pipe in on the property that was leaking mm-hmm. water. And this the pipe had been leaking for quite a while, apparently. And we our, our the water bill that we underwrote had the leak in it. But then once we got the property, we found out, hey, there's a leak and we were able to fix it. Now our water bill gets cut in half. Guess what? That that trickles down to our NOI, which all of a sudden has an extra, say, 30, 50 grand savings on it. You know, that increases the value of the property. You multiply mm-hmm. that by whatever, seven or whatever you want, or whatever you're looking for. That actually was a nice little surprise. Sure. Yeah. Anthony, what else do you have to tell us about this first endeavor and first adventure into real estate investing? 
Yeah, it's not a get-rich-quick game. I've had a great time doing it. I've met a lot of great people. Like I said, I'm continuing to look for that next 200-unit deal or 50-unit deal, whatever. I'm looking for the next deal right now. And it's really been great. And I, I, I encourage people, if you really are thinking about getting into this, don't give up after the first few months. This is a long game. And I think once you get your first deal done and it leads to the next deal and more relationships, I think you'll be very happy that you did not give up. So that's kind of what I would say there. And yeah. And if anybody's got any questions ever, I'll say this now, and I'm sure I can say this at the end, but reach out to me. You can go to my website, financial, financialbedrock.com. Shoot me an email. If you got any questions following this conversation I'm having with Dr. Allen, I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Okay. Viewers and listeners, pay Anthony a visit at financialbedrock.com, and we will have his contact information in the show notes. Well, Anthony, let's go into our last section here. And if you could share with us one of your most difficult setbacks in life, this may or may not be involved in the real estate industry, but how did you come through that time? And uh, what did you learn from that experience? Sure. It's difficult setback. If we do keep it to the real estate one, I will say that after, what was it, maybe about six, eight months of getting started into looking for deals to bring to this group, I did get very close to an 88 unit. It was also out of state. So now, so this would have obviously again been my first deal and it was 88 unit. It, the numbers worked out perfectly. I actually got, actually got an LOI signed by the seller and we went down, me, I actually, I drove down to the property. It was out of state, walked the property with the broker. I was just so pumped up because again, it was just right after getting started. And here I'm thinking, we're going to buy this property. I'm going to, I'm going to do a deal. And so my, I was high, like I was this high up. I was really on a high on, on that. Just already starting to fantasize on, oh my God, I'm going to do all this. And then we get into negotiating the purchase agreement. And the seller would not sign our purchase agreement because they did not agree to the extensions that we wanted. We, our due diligence extension in our purchase agreements, we require that we get extensions of 30 days in case something comes up during due diligence, we have time to investigate it. That way we never have our, we don't want to put our backs against the wall and put ourselves into a position that to lose really. And that's one of our requirements, our purchase agreements. And usually sellers understand that's almost an in industry standard. This seller just wouldn't budge on it. And of course our group would not budge on it and it killed the deal. And so it's, I went from the super high to this very deep low because here all of a sudden I'm sitting back at my desk and the deal is just hundred percent dead. And, and I'm I just sitting there reflecting, okay, what do I do now? Do I keep doing this? Is this even possible? It already took me a half a year to find a, one deal. Then once we, and everything happens to work out, once it does work out, then you can't even get a deal by doing because of some terms and a purchase agreement. At that point, I was like, it's gotta be almost impossible to do a deal, to ever do a deal. And so that was a low and how I overcame that was just, I just, I did a little reflecting. I was like, you know what? It's got to work. People are doing it. Had to reconvince myself that it's, that this thing works. And then it, it did help. I had a conversation with the group afterwards and they, you know, and in going back to coaching, he gave me a little coaching pep talk and said, this stuff happens, but don't give up on it. Keep fighting, keep analyzing those deals. Eventually one's going to, one's going to work out. So that was definitely a low point in the real estate business. How I got over it, it's good to have a team and, and people to support you and just reflect on, on the situation and move forward. Yeah, it certainly would have been easy to quit. That right. is discouraging, and but it's just part of the business, and uh, it's probably not the last time that's happened. I know. The way this I'll concerns. be ready for it. Well, you've already been through that, so right. yeah, right. it will be easier the next time. Just imagine here for a moment that you have come to the end of your life. And as you lay on your deathbed, what do you look back on with your greatest joy and a sense of satisfaction? Yeah. So going back actually to the South Africa wine documentary. So obviously I, I hope I have a lot more life left to, to create memories to reflect on. But one of the things I really do am passionate about, I want to get back into is creating more of those documentaries and then pivot with those documentaries. Once I have an audience and really do documentaries around the world on different topics. I like positivity. I like the power of positive thinking. I like, so I really want to create documentaries that enlighten people and get into coaching and stuff like that. So when I look forward towards the end of my days and if, when I want to reflect back on my life, that's what I want to see. I want to see that 
I help people. I made the play the world in, in a more positive place because that's what that's what we need more than anything. There's just so much hatred and and um, negativity out there. So I want to have a positive impact. Obviously, I want to reflect back on having a great family and all the great people I met and um, all the experience I experiences I had and and ways that I gave back. So that's what I look forward to being able to look back on. So yeah, you know. sounds wonderful, and it sounds like you're on track. That goes to that big why that people often talk about. And most people are very surprised that it really isn't the money. In your case, it's the time freedom to be a documenterer, if right. that's what you call them, and to bring to life stories of people who've made a positive difference. Anthony, it's been a pleasure having you once again, and it's good to be able to check in with you and see things are going well and that you're pushing forward and going right ahead with, with your real estate investing plans. So thanks for being here. Dr. Allen, thank you for having me. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing Abundance brought to you by Steve Talker Capital, a company working for passionate professionals like you to develop financial independence built on solid passive real estate investments. As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steve Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steve Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures, great and small, flourish abundantly. For resources to develop your financial independence, connect with us at stevetalker.com.